All right. Thank you so much for coming to this bonus session. This is one of those bonus sessions that you're going to learn stuff. And you are going to learn a lot. I've already had a preview of this when I was talking with the inventor of the platypod and the platyball. His name is Larry Tiefenbrunn, and he is the main presenter that you will be listening to this evening. Hey, Larry T., how are you? Hi, Larry. Always good to be back here and back at Photoshop World. I think my first time and where I met you first was Photoshop yeah. World in Las Vegas, 2015. And here we are, 2022, virtually. And who knows, maybe we'll get together again sometime in the near future. Or we can just go to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's oh, also good. Yeah, you never know. Um, okay, so this evening I want to give folks an idea of what to expect. And what you're going to see this evening is a lot of really good behind the scenes and some finished photos that will get you close. And I'm talking about two kinds of close up. One of them is like macro or close up food photography or product shots. And then the other kind of close-up, the other way to think about it, is using camera technology, a, a brilliant lens, to get something that's far away to be closer to you. And in some cases, the close thing, like with macro, it ends up being larger than life. And in some cases, it's not larger than life, but it fills the frame. So if if somebody's, uh, you know, you've got a, a large animal or something like that, well, obviously they're going to be bigger than the picture, but if it fills the frame, that's getting really close to that animal. So that's the focus, no pun intended, for this evening is to get us close. And Larry T is going to show us the finished images, the behind the scenes, and also, and this is the great part, you get to understand the gear that gets you there, that gets these images uh, reproducible. And so you're gonna learn an awful lot. So Larry T, I don't wanna delay any further. I'd love to hand things off to you and ask you to please start the presentation that everybody's waiting for. Oh, but I do wanna say one other thing. Ask questions. If you guys have any questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A. And there are Platypod pros folks that work at Platypod and also Kelby One Pros that are monitoring the chat. And they're going to answer you in the chat while we're live. But if there are any questions that are held over for Larry T, uh, at the end of the presentation, he'll answer those. OK, now I can hand it off to you, Larry. OK, and please, I do want to emphasize again, I love questions. We are here live. We're taking this in real time, so please. Uh, fire away. Now we're gonna we're gonna start a, a uh, slideshow in just a few minutes. I do have a few brief amount uh, announcements. I'm sorry we we did promise more info, less commercial on this, so I'll get to that right away. But I'm so excited to announce that the Platypod Extreme has won its first award, the 2022 Hot Ones Award from PPA, the Professional Photographers of America Association. I'm very proud of this. I wanted to share that good news with you that was published uh, this uh, just this month in um, in the uh, Professional Photographers uh, uh, magazine. So thank you to PPA and thank you all for supporting uh, the Platypod Extreme. We're also announcing some price reductions. Our <coughs> Platypod disc has now come significantly down in price. Go look at the website. You'll see that. And so has the platypod multi accessory kit so please shoot over when we're done to platypod.com if you're interested in those items we also are announcing that we now have uh after a lot of evaluation i'll talk about this a little bit more later taken on a portrait and studio tripod i'm not recommending this as a travel tripod but i'm going to show that to you later it's the benro mach 3 tripod and it's a perfect fit for your platypod, for your platyball elite or ergo, if you have those, and if you don't, you know we can talk about that later too. Uh, we will show several examples of usage of our products, including the extreme macro bundle and macro accessory bundles. And if you'll have questions on that, I'll take it. But I do want to dive right into the slideshow and stick around to the end of the show. We will have some special offers for platypod. All right, let's begin. First of all, again, for those who've, of you who've just joined us, 
to say thank you for attending Photoshop World 2022. It's an honor to be here and to be able to present to all of you. And I hope you all learn a little something from my uh, presentation, maybe even more than that. So our topic for today, which I've been dying to talk about because it's really something near and dear to me, and that is close-up photography and how our tools can somehow help you a little bit with that. But we're going to focus more on the imagery. Now, as Larry mentioned, there's two ways to get in really close to your subject to give it a larger-than-life look. One is by shooting from a further distance with a long telephoto lens, as you can see Rick Salmon doing here, from the comfort of his back porch just perched on a table, and he has this 200 to 400 millimeter zoom lens. And Rick told me that he likes shooting at about f5, f5.6, just to give him a little bit of latitude. The new cameras that are out there are incredible at focusing in on the eyes of a person, and now even on the eyes of a bird or an animal. And you can see how tack sharp this image on the left of the uh, song sparrow is and also his title image at the bottom right that he used for his uh, presentation, his Kelby One presentation, apropos, it's named Backyard Bird Photography, and that is available for those of you who are Kelby One members. This, sh this shot also taken with a similar setup <coughs> of a uh, of a downy woodpecker with a little seed in its mouth. And this is a small bird, but you see how this actually, even just on your screen, probably looks larger than the bird itself. So that's one type of close-up photography, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about another type of, of close-up photography where you get in really close to your subject. Now, a little to be said first about lighting. Uh, Larry, you had some comments that you wanted to make on that, correct? Yeah, I sure do. The The interesting thing to me is when I was looking at this image, and, and I know Eddie Tapp and, and the great instruction that he provides and that you will reveal as we get into this, and I, I think this kind of also goes back to what Scott said in the opening keynote. He, he said something about how we view things in person, in 3D, versus what the finished image turns out to be. And Scott was talking about things like in, in one of his examples, a beautiful church, but then there were these power lines and nobody ever saw them. And then when Scott took the picture and he had the power lines there, he, he photoshopped them out because they were irrelevant and we don't see those and we don't experience those. With that in mind, there's something similar going on whenever you take pictures of people, portraiture and, um, uh, just pictures of people. They are going to be flat. That's what photography does. It takes the three-dimensional world that we live in and we experience and it flattens it out. And that's why lighting is so important. And I can tell you when you're doing video, lighting, and, and all my video friends are going to kill me for this, lighting is less important than when you're doing photography, still photography. Well, let me tell you why I think that. If you have a setup of lighting in video, they call flat lighting. So in other words, your subject, I'm, I'm a person on camera, and if all the light in this studio, and we have great studio light here, but if all the light in the studio was just set up to just make me look flat and two-dimensional, but I'm still talking and moving around, and you see my expression, and you see the dimensionality of my face as I'm moving around, well, video is more forgiving of flat lighting, but still imagery is not. So that's why the right kind of lighting with still images matters so much more. That's why we wanna learn from the pros. That's why we go to Photoshop world and learn from the best photographers out there. And that's why what Dr. T is about to show you from Eddie Tapp is so important when it comes to taking a lifelike, dimensional, flat, photo. So that's my two cents. Okay. So Larry and, and to, to our audience, and again, thank you all for joining me for those of you who are just coming in now. The point of this image 
is to show you how you can arrange a setup so that you can learn lighting for close-up photography, so that you can practice your lighting. And it's very important before you go, if, especially if you're going to do this professionally, go on assignments, to practice what you're going to be doing with lighting. So let's just go, go through the setup that Eddie has here. Now, he's actually using a long lens. I'm, I'm not yet getting into the, uh, to the closer lens I, that I spoke uh, about before. We're going to do that soon. He's got this set up on a tripod, and if you're going to use continuous lighting, and when we're talking about macro photography, in general, I'm going to highly recommend using continuous, and now it's LED lighting instead of the hot tungsten lights that we used to use in the past. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you want to do this, you want to basically have several things in consideration. Number one, you need a stable surface, a tripod, a platypod, whatever it is, a stable support for your camera because you're going to be doing some longer exposures. When you're going close in, you want to try to maximize your depth of field. To do that, you're going to have to stop down the lens and really, really increase that depth of field. But to do that, you're also going to need to lengthen your exposure. So when I'm doing close-up photography, I'm often shooting at f16, 22, and with some of my macro lenses, I'll go up to f40 to get a maximal uh, maximal depth of field. There is an alternative way to do it, which is called focus stacking. That's a little bit out of the scope of this talk, but you can look into that look into that as well. So number one is to have a stable support for your camera. Now, one thing I'll disagree with what Eddie did here, he turned the uh, platyball here on its side and uh, to get a, uh, a vertical, a, a portrait orientation to the photo, I would have simply left the platyball straight up and just rotated the camera and the collar ring of the lens to get that, uh, that horizontal. I guess Eddie wanted to be a little bit more dramatic. And he's got one of our platypod discs uh, on, at the bottom of that collar ring support attaching to the, uh, to the platyball. Let's get, into the, let's get into the image. We're going to go a little closer. You can see there's a light table in the background. And he has a mannequin on there. And he's got several things under consideration here. First of all, you got to light the background and you want to get some separation between the subject and the background. He's getting that separation using some gelled lights underneath the table. And we'll talk in a second about how you can make your own translucent light table if you don't want to have to spend, you know, just getting into this. And uh, if you're going to do it permit, you know, for a long term, I would buy something like this. But if you just want to dabble, I'll show you a way that you can do that in a few minutes. So he's got several lights attached underneath the translucent sweep, what's called, again, what's known as a light table. In the left-hand picture, you can also see right in the center, clamped onto the side of this with one of our platypod clamps, mini super clamps, a light that is facing towards the back of the mannequin. Now, going back here, you can see in this image, there's a round disc right over that mannequin and you can't see the light. That's exactly the point. That light is being blocked from the view of the camera with that black disc, which prevents lens flare. If a light is shining directly into the camera, you're gonna get some lens flare, you're gonna get some hazing in the, uh, in the image, and you wanna really avoid that. So blocking this out with what's known as a gobo, an object that goes between the light and the camera, is very helpful. The main light that Eddie's using on his subject is a, is a LumaCube Panel Pro. This is a, a complete RGB light. You can make it any color that you want, but here, He's using this as a softbox to illuminate his subject. And you can see this in the final image. You can see the light coming in from there. When you're talking about relative size of the light to the subject and the closeness of the subject, that's what determines the softness of the light, the softness of the shadows. And you can play around with this by moving the light further from the subject closer to the subject, and I encourage you to do this. If you don't have a mannequin like this, which is available at several art stores, at many art stores, uh, you could use 
an old Barbie doll or an action figure to accomplish the same thing. Now, when you're lighting with a key light, which this is known as, or a main light, from an angle, you're going to cast shadows and sometimes very intense shadows. In order to lessen those shadows, you want to have a little bit of fill, which can be done with a second light, or in this case, look at the left-hand picture or the middle upper picture. Eddie has a folded piece of foam core taped together in the middle, and this is known as a V-flat. He's made his own V-flat. Uh, you can purchase V-flats for full-size portraiture from our friends at V-flat World or other places. But here he made his own, and the purpose of that is to throw some of that main key light from the Panel Pro back into the other side of the subject's face. Now, I'm going to break out here for just a second to just very, very briefly mention something about lighting ratios. When you have even lighting from one side and equal lighting from the other side, that's considered a one-to-one -one lighting ratio, and that's very much used in beauty shots, sometimes it'll be from above and below, so that you don't, you'll have a shadowless image. Again, used for modeling, used for, for beauty shots, but when you wanna create drama, you want your lighting ratios to be a little different. Two to one means I have twice as much light on one side as on the other side. Three to one, three times as much light, or one and a half f-stops, uh, If you, for those of you who, who understand how to use the f-stop calculations. I find that a really great way to set up lights, whether it's with continuous lights or even like this, and to get the correct exposure is to use a light meter. Now, this is a meter I've had for about, I don't know, 20 years or so. They come in many different styles. But when you turn this on and you set the ISO on the meter, all you do is push a button and it will tell you a range of f-stops and shutter speeds so that you can get a correct exposure and you simply hold this, which is an incident meter, right at the subject pointing to the light that you're gonna use. That's very important because if you're gonna use multicolored lights and one basically white light, you wanna point it at that white light to get the correct, uh, uh, to get the correct exposure. That's as opposed to a different type of meter which your camera uses, known as a reflective meter, and that's a completely different subject. But when you're talking about doing studio lighting measurements, an incident meter, which you'll see, which will usually have a little white bulb on it like this, is the kind of meter to use. The other thing that I like to use to get accurate color is something known as an Expo disc. These have been around a long time. You put this over your camera, and you have to read your camera manual about how to do manual white balance, but this will allow you to set your white balance according to the color of the light coming into your subject. So you would hold this from the subject, pointing into the light, take a test exposure according to your camera's instructions, set the white balance, and your entire shoot. If you do these two things, you probably will not have to touch exposure or color balance when you bring all of this into Lightroom or Photoshop, because everything will be set already for you. Let's get back into the image. So here you can see now your final image. And one other point that I want to make over here is that it's very important that your background has a nice contrast with your subject, that there's what's known as separation between the background and the subject. The colors should work together. And uh, color theory is something that my friend uh, Hilmar Smith is expert at, and she's got a class on Kelby One on how to do, how to use color properly in your images so that you'll get good separation. Larry, do you have any comments on this before we move on? No, I think we're good. I, you're nailing it all. And, and the interesting thing to me is how all of this can be set up in something small like that light table so that we can practice. And, and this works at any scale. It works small and large. The lights can be bigger, but, but this works really well for the topic that we're talking about tonight, which is those product shots, macro shots, and close-up shots. And thanks for reminding me about the light table. I wanted to show everybody how I made my first light table 
Very simple. I went to Home Depot and purchased a sheet of, um, this is, I think, acrylic uh, plexiglass. I punched in two holes. I drilled two holes in here, put some grommets in, some strings with some clips at the top, and I basically was able to hang this from the rafters in my basement and then curve it underneath and then clamp it onto some uh, sawhorses. So it has to be basement, so it, that it has to be the right thickness because if you go really thick, it's going to be less flexible. So you want to go something like a quarter inch or thinner. Or this is about an eighth of an inch. There you that, go. That, that and that, that's why you can get that nice flex uh, shape from that plexiglass or lucite that you purchased. Now that's the transparent part, but you need some translucency if you want to get color and you don't want to be able to just see right through it. Right. And right. for that. You guys might want to write this down. This is something called Denril. This is a uh, basically a plastic sheet that's often used by architects in the old days when they used to have to trace things by hand. So it's basically tracing paper, but it's really plastic. It's very durable. And when you light this with different colored lights or even just white light, you get some amazing effects behind your subject. So you can build your own light table. Of course, again, if you're going to do it professionally, you probably want to purchase one like Eddie Tapp used uh, so that you have easy setup. But uh, there's a nice little uh, cheap shot for, uh, for everybody out there. Let's go to this next picture. We talked about making things look larger than life. To do that, you often either use to, need to use a big telephoto lens or get very close to your subject. Now, when you're talking about a steeplechase race, you don't want to get in that close to your subject uh, because uh, that'll be quite dangerous. So what my friend Jim Graham did over here is he set up his camera behind the fence on a platypod that's spiked into the ground and he set it up as a remote. I'm going to show you quickly how to do that. But look what an amazing picture. I, I just, listen, if you think about setting up things in threes and composition and everything, clearing everything else, this is just an unbelievable uh, picture in my oh, mind. Oh, it is. So it, it, let looks, me, uh, it, looks like yes. a, it looks like a planned shoot with models and professional uh, horse riders, not like a, a freeze frame from a real world race. That's incredible. It is. So this is basically the kind of rig that Jim was using. Now, there's other ways to do it. But what I recommend, if you're going to do some serious remote photography, now, people will do this sometimes to set something up near a bird's nest or an other uh, animal's home when you don't want to be in that scene and you want to be able to shoot from a distance. Pocket wizards, now I have very old pocket wizards. The newer ones are about half the size of these and about half the cost of these. But pocket wizards allow you to fire off both flashes and cameras remotely. I have this pocket wizard set up with my uh, Nikon camera with a special cable that you need to get from pocket wizard or you can get it over at B&H that will work with your camera. That is camera specific. You plug it in here, you turn this on, you turn the other unit on, which is a transmitter. And with this, you can go up to a thousand feet away and be able to just fire off your camera just like that. Amazing. So it's a great tool if you want to do this. Uh, there are other ways to fire remotely. Our friend uh, Eric Kuna, the rocket man, will use sound triggers so that he can get his rocketry uh, photography. But an interesting thing for you to know about if you want to get close to your subject, but not dangerously close, to get that close-up image. Yeah, and you you know, pocket wizards are a great thing to do to get to eventually uh, because of the reliability and the distance that they cover. But I have cameras and an app from Canon that allows me to remotely trigger my cameras Granted, I have to be fairly close, but I can do it from my cell phone. Absolutely. Now, I hope that no one here thought I was condescending by telling them you should be practicing before you shoot, because even the pros need to practice at home before they go out in the field. And here, Rick Salmon shows a practice setup that he's got 
especially if you're using any new equipment, try it out, use it before you go on a trip and, and figure out on a trip, oh, I don't know how to use this thing and maybe it's broken, maybe it's okay. Practice stuff at home. So here, Rick took these plastic uh, tree frogs and set them up, you know, cutely on this uh, on this artificial flora, and got some really nice shots of it. So that when he went to Costa Rica and had to face the real thing with this red-eyed tree frog, preparing for his class, which is also on Kelby One, called "Uncovering the Magic of the Rainforest." Rick was able to get this beautiful image of this live tree frog, and you can see the little catch light in the eye in the right-hand picture, which he was able to achieve with just a pop of artificial light there. That's amazing. So Bob Coates is showing how to do a setup for flower photography outdoors. Now, when you're indoors, you probably don't need anything this elaborate, but when you're going outdoors and there's a breeze and you don't want to pluck the flower, but you'd rather take it in its natural situation. Bob shows us how, now again, this is using our equipment, but there's several different ways you could do it. He's supporting the flower with a gooseneck that's attached to a platypod extreme. At the end of the gooseneck is a mini super clamp, which can hold objects very strongly or very delic delicately to avoid this moving, because when you're shooting macro like this, any movement will mess up your image. Now here he's using a shallow depth of field just to focus in on the yellow center of the flower and give it a very soft, creamy bouquet on the outside bouquet. I guess that's a pun for flowers, but anyway, <laughs> or say bokeh, some people do. I like to pun. And the other thing that was interesting here is he wanted to avoid harsh sunlight. So he set up on an elbow, one of our platypod elbows in this case, a diffuser, a round 20 inch diffuser, which folds down to I think under uh, 10 inches, which was able to diffuse the sunlight and give you this beautiful soft shadowed light on this object. And that was an oleander flower, by the way. All right, Andrew Scrivani, New York Times food photographer, published a beautiful book, which I recommend. I've, I've shown it before on Kelby presentations called That Photo Makes Me Hungry. It's about the best 20 or so dollars that you'll spend on Amazon. The images are amazing. And Andrew tells his entire story and gives away a lot of tricks as to how to do this. But what Andrew likes to do, and I'll show you an example of this later, when you're shooting food photography, you want to use short lighting. Short lighting in this case means lighting from behind, maybe off from an angle, but basically from behind. It adds a lot of dimensionality to your food. A lot of food is translucent, as you'll see later, or transparent, which also allows color, texture to come through. So here, Andrew very craftily has this glass of whiskey on the piano keys, these piano keys providing a lot of diagonal lines, which adds dimensionality into his image. And he's actually recording a class on iPhone photography uh, for the iPhone photography school that's going to be published pretty soon. And very, very interesting to, to see how this is, uh, how this is used. Well, I decided to dabble a little bit with food photography, too, and I'm showing you the same kind of concept. When you want to light food, whether it's natural lighting using the window of a restaurant or using artificial lighting with these LEDs, as you see here, you want to try to light from behind. So the main light is this little Luma cube coming around the back with a gooseneck, shining onto this fork of pasta salad, which I'll thank my wife for making. Yes, it was quite yummy. A little bit of basil, a little bit of, of tomato in there. Mm, yum. Okay. And, and the fork is supported by a little mini super clamp on a platypod elbow. And what's cool about this is the entire rig, including the red light to add a little heat and a little excitement to the image, is all attached on one little rig 
that you can move around. Now we've taken off the, uh, the camera and the ball head from here, but you just add the camera, add the ball head, and you can take this image real close up as shown here. Any comment on that, Larry? Yeah, uh, one is you mentioned that you would put the camera and the ball head onto the platypod. I like this kind of setup where I'm hand holding the camera because I can, in addition to the ball head, you know, the mounted camera and ball head is gonna give you a very stable surface. But being able to move the camera around in that environment, the lighting is fixed, the object is fixed, your subject, and so now you can get your camera a little closer, a little further away, and not have it be on the ball head uh, and get that one and only distance kind of thing with uh, obviously with a little bit of zoom, but then physically being able to move around it. I, I like that option as well. I think for larger objects, I agree with you, Larry. For this one, the way I actually took the photo, that camera was about three inches okay. uh, from the fork. It was on there. The reason I needed that stability and I didn't handhold uh, was to get that maximum depth of field. So you can see the entire fork front to back yeah. in very, very, in very, very good depth of field, all in focus. And to do that, I had to go to somewhat of a slower shutter speed. I think I did this at about a 20th of a second. But yes, if you're working with larger objects, a little bit more distance, you can, you can definitely go ahead and handhold that. I also want to mention that for background here, I used a nice product for my friend uh, over at, uh, over at VFlat World. These are called Duo Boards. And this gives you it's a self-supporting board that goes flat on the surface as well as on the background, and you get some very interesting texture into your shots, and you'll see some other images that I did with this. Uh, head over to V-Flat World, and I highly recommend their product. And thank you to my friend there, Tivi, for supplying the uh, duo boards. So the, the <laughs> this is a rather simple image, just shot outdoors. The point of it is... When you're doing toy photography especially, you wanna get low down so that your subject doesn't look minuscule, it makes it look taller. And in this case, really low down to bring in foreground elements such as the grass in this picture. And my friend Robert Vanelli, who shot that last one, also shot this also just to show that, you know what? You don't need a lot of complexity. Here we have a simple main light on a gooseneck with a little cube light on this doll and a fill light on the platypod, just filling in a little bit of the shadows so that he could use this for a greeting card. Here's an interesting shot from Jesse Fireisen. Jesse won the Guru Awards at Photoshop World last year for his toy photography. And Jesse does some amazing stuff. You ought to take a look at his uh, Instagram page. You're gonna see a lot of fascinating Photos. So there's a little bit to unpack here. I actually requested, I gave Jesse a challenge, and that was show me something interesting in toy photography where you use a kitchen implement to make the image more interesting. And Jesse did two things. He used this kitchen grill both as a light control and as a background for the subject. Let me show you the image and we may have to come back and, and unpack that a little bit more. Okay, so here's your final image. Diffuse light on the Boba Fett subject. And this is sort of out of uh, The Empire Strikes Back, one of the yeah. older uh, Star Wars movies. And what Jesse did was he suspended this grill from some goosenecks behind the subject. He then took a Panel Pro light, a LumaQ Panel Pro light, and put it underneath that background with about 75% of the light behind the background and about 25% of it in front of it, giving a little bit of pop of light on the camera side of this. Now, a lot of that light from behind is also shining onto a foam core card behind there. The main light on the subject, which you can see right up into the left of the camera, well, that's a, a LumaCube panel, another LumaCube panel pro that's bouncing off of a reflector card to give very, very diffuse light. This is the equivalent of using an enormous umbrella or softbox uh, on the subject. And now when we go back again to the final image, you can see the result. 
So you have the background with this grill, which looks, you know, very futuristic. And some of the background is lit in front, otherwise it would be black. He wanted to maintain this as a high key image, an image where most of your pixels are very bright, very light. And he's got the light shining through it because part of that Panel Pro that was underneath the background is behind it and reflecting off the re reflector card from the side. Take one more look at the setup. And if anybody has questions, put those questions in the chat and, uh, or in the Q&A, and we'll get back to them towards the end of the presentation. Here's another way. Jesse used a very similar setup, but what he did was he used a blue background, simply taking a gray card and lighting it blue using the Panel Pro set to blue, since it is a, a fully RGB-capable light. And to give it a little bit of interest, a little bit of smoke, he just used some atmospheric uh, smoke that comes in a can, which you can see at the right-hand side, atmosphere spray, and pop that in there just to give a little dimension. And here, he used the grill underneath <laughs> the subject. And for any of you, those of you who watched The Empire Strikes Back, uh, this very much fits into the theme and the setting of that scheme with everything being on grills. So uh, I thought that was very cool. Dr. T, where can you get atmosphere spray like that? Um, you can get them at B&H, uh, at Adorama. There's uh, just go on to uh, Amazon and, and look up atmosphere spray. Going back to the setup, these props uh, Scott had made up for him by a prop maker. Yes, he's very serious into this. That Pac-Man machine back there actually works. I believe these uh, figures are 12 inches high and uh, very nicely lit, very nicely set up. The props are amazing uh, in here. And again, you see the final image over here. Quite interesting. Next, for product photography, Shiv Verma is showing us how you use diffuse light to light up a product properly. Now, for product photography, you want everything well lit, everything in focus. Here, he's got his main light, which is the LumaCube Panel Pro, bouncing off of a card onto the subject, and the same from the right-hand side using the LumaCube torch. Everything is set up nice, and you see this beautiful, clear image. This is how you want to present a product. Here's one of my images, similar to what we used before with the Platypod Extreme Macro Bundle. This is available on the website. I'm not going to pitch this hard, but if you'll look, uh, you'll see later on uh, there are some substantial savings uh, on this uh, kit, especially for those here at Photoshop World. So I'm showing how you can do a little bit of a different ring shot by using these multicolored candies. I didn't quite have enough candies to fill the entire uh, the entire container here, so I stuffed a few marshmallows underneath it to do that and to bring up the candies to the surface. But the color in here helps to enhance the diamond, and I'll show you that in the next image in a close-up. But again, we're giving a little bit of background color using the LumaCube Panel Pro, main light coming from this clean white light coming out of the uh, LumaCube uh, 2.0, and bouncing back a little bit of reflection from the right-hand side that you can see in the setup with a mirror that's held up by a platypod elbow. So, you know, you play around with this stuff, you get the lights adjusted just where you want it, but you can see in real time what you're doing and how the image is going to look. Next image, super close up, shows you how these candies give multicolored reflections into the diamond, plus the heat coming off, or that red reflection coming off the, uh, the Panel Pro, which is lit up in red. I hope you like this one. Next, Eric Cooper is showing in the field how you can get really close to the subject 
uh, without using a standard tripod, which you would have had to flip upside down, flip the center column upside, de- uh, upside down. Here, Platypod gets in really, really close to this lichen growth. Very interesting, almost abstract. I believe this is a stacked image with several uh, images used in focus stacking. Again, outside of the scope of our discussion, but please go ahead and look up focus stacking. I think you'll find a lot of excellent uh, teaching videos on that, especially on uh, YouTube and right here on Kelby One. My friend Don Kamarechka, the the mad scientist of macro photography, uh, who his book is uh, selling out, by the way, and uh, I think we can We'll show that in the corner of the next slide. But anyway, Don's got an interesting setup here. He's got a mantis that is set on a petal of a Gerbera daisy flower and a little tiny droplet of water that you can see right there on a small seedling of a dandelion. Uh, I think Don likes to call these um, uh, sailors. Uh, because they they'll sail sail around the in the air, and the final image produced by this. Now he's using a whole bunch of bright flashlights to really light this up like crazy. I would encourage you to please head over to platypod.com, take a look at our different products. We have a lot of good instructional materials there, and uh, I just want to thank you all. Also, when you're there, please check out. You've got this amazing new tripod that we're using. It's the Benro uh, Mach 3 tripod that's really great for uh, for your portrait and studio photography and can be used together with the Platyball beautifully or with, really with any, uh, with any tripod head. So, again, my apologies for the technical difficulties. Well, now, Dr. And- T, Dr. T, I have a quick question. Yes. You are on screen and you're there in your studio. And while we can't see the slideshow, I want to walk through some of the products that you have because there are some brand new things that people haven't seen a whole lot. So there's like the Platypod Extreme that's new to some people. And there is the Platypod Elbow. And so I'm, I'm hoping, and we've seen these in some of the behind the scenes shots in the um, Uh, in the slideshow that you were showing. But you can do this from the studio and just like hold it up in front of the camera because I don't want people to miss out on those things. All right, guys. So uh, first, really, and we use this for many of the uh, images in in, uh, our production. This is the Platypod Macro Bundle, Extreme Macro Bundle. It comes with a Platypod, ooh, Platypod Extreme. It comes with four goosenecks that you can see over here. It comes with a panel pro light that you saw in many of the images and also a LumaCube uh, torch light here, as well as the Platypod elbow. And this elbow is really cool. Let me, uh, let me just show you that. Again, my apologies. I wasn't going to do so much of a uh, commercial over here, but, uh, you know. Yeah, you got to realize this is why people are tuned in, is to learn about the gear, too. Live TV is what it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a Platypod elbow. This is a really cool device because this will screw into your Platypod, whether you have an Ultra or the Extreme with the new flip-down legs. And, again, the website will show you a lot about that. So this screws right in here. Now, there are other brands of elbows around. What's special about ours is it will not protrude from the bottom of the Platypod. And what an elbow does is it will lock three different joints as well as two collars, rotating collars, with one single control knob. And then you can just take whatever device you want to put on top of here, and whether it's a camera or a light or one of our clamps, and it will lock in. This is a platypod clamp mini super clamp and for example if you want to put this right onto the elbow it screws right in with a thumb wheel and like i said it can hold something as gentle as a flower or it can hold up to a one and a half inch utensil pipe whatever whatever you want to put that on so these are very very useful tools and again it's elaborated on a little bit more at platypod.com 
Uh, any questions that, that we got there, Larry? Um, no, I, I think we're, we're pretty good on the questions. What I'm trying to do is figure out, because we don't have my laptop wired in, but I have the uh, slide presentation that you were showing, and what I want to do is ask the guys in the studio, is it possible for you to focus on my Mac screen so I can show just a couple quick things? Can you guys do the, okay. So, there we go. This is, <laughs> so, uh, I'll do my best. Okay, so this is uh, Larry T's setup in his studio, and it shows a couple of the bundles, and it shows a, uh, that. So what I used in that image, and I, I keep this in my basement, it's something you can get on uh, Amazon, b &H. It's a light box. It's yeah. basically a two by two foot portfolio that opens up into a box and as you can see in the image there it's it actually has inside it an led light on one side it has an led light on the top and that gives you full fill light and key light on your on your right. products it's great for product photography because you can pop this thing open in about 90 seconds plug it in and it's ready to roll you can always add additional lights into it then what i did is i took a tripod just like that and on top of it, I used, hang on, hang on. and this comes under different b brands, I use the Oben arm. Larry, do you have the model number of this arm? I do not have that handy. I, okay. I have it here okay. somewhere. Look look for an Oben boom arm on uh, on B&H. Oh, and I got it now. I got it now. It's the Oh, I got a Tab 4M. That's it. Yep. T-A-B 4M. And that allows you to attach a camera with a ball head right on the end like this, okay? So I could just add on my ball head over here and it allows you to shoot overhead right through the top of that. Now, that, while that's not really macro photography, it is very useful for product photography when you have to uh, do a layout. And that picture that you see is actually the layout that I use for our own website uh, to show all the included objects in the um, macro uh, bundle. That's cool, and the guys behind the scenes are getting really tight on my laptop, so that's what we're showing right now. I wanted to show two last slides as we wrap up, and one of them is just get by platypod.com and check out the platypod ecosystem. All right, there we are. Dr. T, thank you so much for battling through these technical difficulties. Ooh, this was a tough one. <laughs> Sorry, guys. First time this has ever happened. I will try to make sure that that never happens again. We'll catch you at the next uh, Kelby event, and hopefully one day live at a Photoshop world. We'll see you. Very good. All right, guys, there are more things coming up this evening, of course, as you know. And so I'm going to sign off for now because we're a little bit over, and uh, I'll see you in some of the other events, whether it's Moose Peterson or Midnight Madness. We'll see you.